Okay, since we are talking about evolution of behavior and have mentioned uh, the brain, brain size and potential uh, feedbacks between the use and uh, growth or neural connections, neuronal connections in the brain and so on, uh, I will add a couple of podcasts here that uh, point to the dependence of brain size on a diet um, and maybe other environmental parameters like temperature, rainfall and so on, as well as uh, why brain size may be shrinking in the Holocene, which we don't know. So obviously I'm going to be again very brief and maybe even superficial, but uh, these are important things just to understand that uh, uh, brains ha did grow in size and now they uh, they are shrinking uh, doesn't seem to be related to the change in body size we already mentioned how Neanderthals had a bigger brain but maybe their cognitive abilities were not as high as uh, Homo sapiens so all these things are uh, something you have to carry uh, as a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, inferences we can make uh, based on fossil evidence and now uh, new research keeps adding uh, more details but then many questions remain open. So increase in brain size, a previous hypothesis just from this uh, blog here, improved dietary quality, so cooking, this is why we, people look at when humans mastered fire because the idea was the gut size was bigger and with uh, uh, cooking uh, digestion became easier, stomach sank and b m maybe more brain, more uh, energy became available to the brain. For example, now an adult uh, brain uses about 20% of the energy even though it's a very small part of the overall body in terms of the size um, and access to key brain nutrients. So these are kind of ideas that have been proposed. What Hardy's paper adds that's a new one is that cooking a uh, cooked starchy tubers uh, added uh, to the uh, growth of the cranium as well so going way back here uh, to more than uh, 10 million years ago uh, we have talked about how we came from uh, Sanj Anthropoidae sorry uh, to Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens appear uh, with uh, Neanderthals in the middle. The brain size went up uh, from 500 uh, cubic centimeters to 1500 cubic centimeters. So that's a fairly significant rise, especially in the end here. There was some non-linear jump almost and then uh, it's uh, shrinking. So this paper looks at cranial capacity uh, in terms of uh, the log uh, cubic centimeters. Uh, age before present again looking at Miocene hominids. We talked about uh, Miocene in the introduction. Uh, Australopithecus homo, uh, early homo, uh, homo erectus, uh, middle Pleistocene homo, homo sapiens. So if you zoom into the this last part here, uh, basically uh, from over the, let's say, the uh, Pleistocene glaciation cycles, you can see that there is a nonlinear jump uh, from Pleistocene Homo sapiens uh, brain size uh, growing. So Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens sapiens, and so on. Uh, are they all explained? Well, not necessarily, but you have also had coexisting small-brained hominids like Naledi and Floresiensis uh, who survived in their own niche habitats, uh, uh, hunting and so on. So coming back to the Scientific American article, uh, which is a bit older and is written in a narrative that's meant to be accessible. So young chimpanzees seek fruit as part of a diet that consists primarily of ripe fruits uh, supplemented by leaves and some animal prey. Obtaining the foods needed for adequate nutrition in the tropical forest turns out to be significantly more difficult for primates than was once believed. The author contends that the solutions adopted by primates millions of years ago strongly influenced the subsequent evolution of the primate 
order itself, speciation. The drawing on the opening pages uh, depict some typical plant food available to arboreal animals in the tropical forest, which I didn't show. But the point here is that uh, the evolution along the way of things like the fiber fermenter, which is the digestive tract of colubine monkeys, such as that in Colobus uh, Gireza is specialized. The stomach consists of two distinct compartments instead of the single chamber found in vel uh, vervet monkeys and most of the other primates. Uh, the uh, four stomach is designed to extract more energy from fiber than would typically be obtainable. So that's an incredible invention. Colobine monkeys can thus survive on a more fibrous diet than other primates for uh, primates of similar size can. So since there is more fibrous material and seeking ripe fruit for example uh, avoids the more fibrous uh, unripe food, uh, fruit let's say okay. So here is uh, the uh, uh, fiber di uh, fermenter with the four stomach, al alkaline uh, four stomach containing celluloid cellu Lolytic <laughs> cellulolytic bacteria, there you go. Um, so this is the acid in the stomach which helps the uh, fermenting of fiber and as it runs through the small intestine and cecum and colon here, you can see how this particular uh, ferment, uh, fiber fermenter is uh, much larger and uh, doesn't exist in terms of a four stomach in the uh, other uh, primates okay so this is a much smaller acid stomach uh, and small intestine is also smaller in terms of the length there is the cecum uh, and colon so there are differences uh, here as well so did they evolve because of uh, a, a consistent use of high fiber diet versus non high fiber diet it's not uh, easy to answer those kind of questions but high fiber content uh, cell walls of plant parts especially mature leaves can contain much fiber which it is resistant to digestion so even now when we talk about bioenergy we're talking about uh, ways of uh, converting cellulose which is a lot of the material that uh, doesn't easily digest even in a biodigester we use to produce methane for example uh, if there is a way to digest cellulose then suddenly much more of the plant material and many more of the plants will become available for bio uh, gas as well uh, fiber in plant cells so there is cellulose hemicellulose and pectin primary cell wall cell um, cellulose, secondary cell wall, hemicellulose and lignin. Lignin is the hard, the, the hard uh, support material and so on and so forth. So again, just briefly, um, looking here at uh, howler monkey uh, eats large quantities of leaves whereas spider monkey is a fruit specialist. So this is like uh, what we talked about before in terms of browsers and grazers. Grazers sit lower in the nutritional quality in terms of grasses whereas browsers eat leaves and fruits and flowers uh, and so on. Um, the uh, author uh, of this article proposes that this is from the Scientific American as well uh, diet played a major role in the shaping of different traits of the two like-sized species which shared a common ancestor. Natural selection favored a larger brain in spider monkeys in part because uh, enhanced mental capacity helped them uh, remember where ripe fruits could be found. And spider monkeys range farther each day uh, in any patch of forest, ripe fruits are uh, le less abundant than leaves. The digestive traits of howler and spider monkeys promote efficient extraction of nutrition from leaves and fruits respectively. So if you remember here the gut size, uh, presumably this affects how much energy is wasted uh, in digestion uh, versus uh, how much becomes then available for the brain and how that affects the brain uh, as mentioned here. So they are typically, uh, they are similar in size. Typical diet of the howler monkey includes uh, fruits at only 42%, leaves at 48% and flowers at 10% whereas the spider monkey uh, uh, eats 22% uh, fruits, 
sorry, 72% fruits, 22% leaves and flowers at 6%. So similar sizes and brain size though is very different. 50.3 grams here and 107 grams uh, here. Uh, the day range is only 443 meters because lots of leaves are available easily whereas to look for ripe fruits the day range here is almost a kilometer okay so large colon slow passage of food through the colon small colon fast passage of food through the colon so it's natural to expect that maybe uh, homo sapiens and hominids hominins also had uh, a dietary impact on uh, their brain size and uh, brain wiring and then the question is whether uh, that allowed them to invent better diets to improve the brains and now you get a lot of ads saying uh, supplements for improving your brain especially with age diets that help the brain and so on and so forth so this is another related thing where number of food related behaviors exhibited by individuals goes up as the uh, percent uh, time percent of time spent with other individuals so this is orangutans and chimpanzees here so you can see that chimpanzees spend uh, uh, show more food related behaviors uh, and the percent time spent with other individuals is higher whereas orangutans are lower here so populations in which individuals have more chances to observe others in action show a greater diversity of learned skills than populations offering fewer learning opportunities the relation holds for both chimpanzees and orangutans what I'm trying to do here is to say that maybe food related behaviors and diets and brain size and so socialist socializing are also related because in humans uh, people with larger amygdala tend to be more social of course when you drink the amygdala temporarily gets uh, bigger and you become more social as well uh, and so on so there are these uh, interesting relations between uh, social networks brain size brain wiring uh, later uh, in age uh, mental uh, uh, problems um, disease mental diseases and so on and so forth so the story gets quite uh, interesting and complicated so just to uh, transition to looking at how brain size has changed more recently let's just visit some of the hypotheses uh, there is the environmental stress hypothesis uh, which looks at uh, environmental bra uh, um, variables and talks about uh, body size and brain size so things uh, I will show one plot looking at these various parameters here environmental constraints hypothesis says sufficient nutrient required for larger body and brain size so here again main uh, annual precipitation net primary productivity and so on are looked at mean precipitation of the driest quarters so here is a negative correlation uh, this has got a positive correlation so colder drier and nutrient poor environments affect uh, uh, the body size and brain size negatively whereas sufficient nutrients affects it positively environmental variability hypothesis says that larger the environmental variability uh, larger the body and the brain size and there is a positive uh, correlation I'm not saying how significant they are I'm just pointing out some interesting uh, hypotheses and again in multiple hypotheses means we don't have a, a one single agreed upon answer environmental consistency hypothesis consistent climate uh, affects larger body and brain uh, brain size and variable cl uh, climate leads to smaller body and brain size which is similar to this one so but this has a negative correlation that uh, consistent climate doesn't need uh, to a larger body and brain so note that different temporal scales of the environmental variables obviously uh, temperature uh, larger decorrelation scale persistence uh, rainfall very episodic uh, large smaller scale and so on and so forth so those kinds of details have to be looked at as well so this puts it together saying that when they look at the body size uh, bra uh, sorry um, what's the difference here so we are looking at uh, mid Pleistocene uh, and this is looking at mean annual temperature and this is looking at temperature of the coldest quarter 
and this is looking at brain size with net primary productivity and brain size uh, with mean annual precipitation. I won't go into the details but you can see generally there is a negative correlation body size uh, in the mid Pleistocene uh, homos, Neanderthals and Pleistocene homo sapiens all show negative correlation with uh, increase, increasing mean annual temperature uh, and uh, the coldest temperature of the quarter uh, and the mid Pleistocene homo Neanderthals and Pleistocene homos uh, again brain size also shows a negative correlation uh, but here uh, with net primary production productivity in grams carbon per meter squared primary productivity is basically you can think of it as available uh, uh, plants leaves all together uh, nutrition in some form uh, from photosynthesis. Uh, so Neanderthals, less steep correlation here and Pleistocene Homo sapiens almost show a negative uh, correlation uh, or sorry, a positive, this is negative and this is almost positive or flat where brain size is maybe slightly increasing with increased net primary productivity uh, here. Um, and uh, with annual precipitation also you can see slightly negative correlations. So I'm going to leave this here just to uh, uh, remind ourselves that environmental variables and diet together uh, seem to have affected brain size at least in terms of correlations. Causality is not easy to infer and there is potentially a relation with uh, social network as well. How much time is spent with uh, other members of this uh, soci of the social group seems to affect uh, the number of food related behaviors so cooperation uh, and learning from other uh, watching and learning uh, is supposed to have led to cooperation among humans as well for example if somebody invented a nice uh, way to catch a fish somebody else can watch it and then steal the idea and beat you to it in the competition but if you work together then you can all benefit, uh, especially when you hunt big games like big whales or uh, elephants and so on and so forth. So the story obviously is not uh, resolved, but it's good to keep in mind that all these things uh, must have affected the brain size along the way. So we'll now come back and look at uh, the, some evidence that brain size in fact has been shrinking among uh, Homo sapiens in the last 10,000 years or so. We don't exactly know the answer why, but uh, we'll conjecture a little based on what we know. Okay.